Otra vez, para interpretación en español, llame al 1-844-855-4444. El PIN es 198-088. In English, um, we have interpretation for this call. Um, please call into Spanish um, at 1-844-855-4444. The access pin is 198088. We want to apologize that there is no sign language interpretation, but we will have a transcription and closed caption in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for that, Cindy. And, and first, welcome. Uh, thank you for everyone um, who's joining across the country and, and around the world to the rising majority's teaching, movement building in the time of the coronavirus. We're just honored that folks um, decided to join us to take their time out of what we know is a very busy schedule, a very intense time to have such an important conversation about what is movement building currently in this moment. But before I get started, first let me talk to you and share a little bit about the rising majority for those that do not know of, of the rising majority and have not joined us yet. First, the, the, the rising majority is a coalition of organizations and movements across sectors committed to building a powerful, a more unified left that is committed to radical democracy, a left that is committed to a transformative vision and structural change and is both anti-racist as well as anti-capitalist. And so we are committed, many of us, whether we're in the movement for Black Lives or the immigrant rights movement or folks that are doing environmental justice and climate change work, we are committed to coming together to amplify our collective power and also putting forth a really transformative vision. I think we can all agree that now more than ever, we need a kind of vision that talks about the level of structural change that we need in this moment. And we organized this teaching, which we've called movement building the time of the coronavirus, because our people all over the world are under not only the challenges caused by this virus, including the terrible loss of life and the illnesses to our loved ones, but we're also suffering as a result of what it means to live under racial capitalism. A reality where the interests of corporate executives, of shareholders, and the wealthy few mean more than the billions of people and the planet of itself. And so this moment for us demonstrates why we need a transformative vision while also fighting for what people need right now in this moment. There is no doubt that we are living in a challenging moment, but we also want to say that while this is a moment of great peril, we are also living in a time and a moment of also great possibility for us to lift up the most transformative, the most powerful, bold demands of our time, and to also build the more unified, the more powerful left our people and the planet deserve. And so this is a conversation to allow us to really get into a collective assessment of what is this moment? Can we forecast out the possibilities of what's to come? And what is required of us as a left in this time? And I am so honored to be um, helping moderate and hold a program with some of the most powerful, brilliant, um, amazing thinkers and minds of our time. We're going to begin with Angela Davis and Naomi Klein. Many people know these great leaders and what they've done in terms of building a, such a, a powerful body of thought and thinking around what is required of us. But first, let me start off with Angela Davis. Many people know Angela Davis. Many of us know um, how, how much she's a powerful leader, a powerful activist, and someone whose work has impacted many of us in the U.S., but also all around the world. And we're also joined by Naomi Klein, an incredible activist, leader, and writer whose thinking and work has had such a profound impact on many activists and organizers um, around the world. So I know you all, whether you're in New York or you're in Johannesburg, South Africa, are excited to be in the company and the presence of such brilliance. Um, and we are so grateful to be in community and to be in movement with you um, in this moment and in this time. So 
as we have this discussion, we also wanted to bring in additional comrades and leaders within the rising majority. So the program will start first with some questions and a dialogue and a discussion with Naomi Klein and Angela Davis. And then we have comrades Maurice Mitchell of the Working Families Party, Sydney, uh, Cindy Wisner of Grassroots Global Justice, and Lone Tran of Southern Vision Alliance, all leaders within the rising majority. We'll have a collective discussion really about how do we build the powerful left that we need in this moment. So I'd like us to now um, invite in Angela Davis and Naomi Klein into this discussion, into this teaching. And we'd like to start off with this first question, which is, what is your assessment of this unprecedented crisis we're living in at this moment? What does it tell us about some of the failures of capitalism in this moment and the threat of disaster capitalist solutions? So I'd like to ask you, Naomi Klein, to start um, by just giving us your assessment. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be um, with you, to be in dialogue with Angela, a hero of mine, um, to be with this incredible group of organizers, um, and to be in a global conversation. Um, I, I, I've been hearing from people all around the world um, who, who have tuned in, some at ungodly hours. Um, and I think it speaks to our deep desire for connection. Um, and I think we, f we feel that more than ever um, because we, so many of us are being denied um, something we've taken for granted for, for our whole lives, which is the ability to be uh, in person um, with our comrades. Um, and we also have to remember that at the same time, so many people do not have the luxury of quarantine, um, whether because they do not have homes to quarantine in or because they're being worked off their feet. So. I think the quick answer to your question is that capitalism is the disaster. Yes, I've written about disaster capitalism, um, but this is a crisis created by capitalism. Um, the pandemic itself uh, is an expression of our war on nature, um, of diseases uh, coming from wilderness into the human sphere because we are encroaching onto the wilderness um, more and more. Um, we are seeing in every way, we know that this disease preys on weak immune systems. We know that, um, that the virus does. But I think if we zoom out, what we see is that our economic system, um, which is so willing and indeed is built upon the willingness to sacrifice life in the interest of profit and always has been, whether the transatlantic slave trade, or whether the natural world um, uh, in the face of the climate crisis. That system has created so many pre-existing conditions for this crisis to deepen, has weakened our collective immune system, um, and created the conditions in which this virus runs rampant. Um, and this expresses itself in so many ways, whether the for-profit medical system in this country, in the United States, or public healthcare systems in Italy, in the UK, that have been starved by relentless austerity for decades, um, or whether the, um, the, the denigration of the work of care, which expresses itself in failing to provide protective equipment, or the denigration of uh, this so-called service work, which is also really the work of care, which we see expressed in the way people um, delivering food, making food, uh, packing boxes are treated as disposable. In, in every way, all of this is making the crisis, the, 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 the virus spread faster and out of control. But in addition to that, we also have disaster capitalism, which means um, that uh, that, that we are seeing what we always see, op that this corporate opportunism that sees this pain, this need, and doesn't say, how do we solve it? Um, how do we save lives? It says, how can I further enrich my own interests? So that is expressing itself right now with um, environmental regulations being suspended in China, in the United States, in the name of, uh, uh, of spurring the economy. It expresses itself in attacks on financial regulations. Um, you know, it's the wish list that gets pushed forward under cover of crisis again and again. 
and also explicit attacks on our uh, ever weakened democracy. So we see um, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, and we see Jair Bolsonaro, and we see Benjamin Netanyahu, and we see Trump himself, all of them making these extreme power grabs for extra, uh, extra powers of surveillance, but in the case of Orban and Netanyahu, rule by decree with no end in sight. Um, so that's the snapshot of, uh, of, uh, of what we are up against, I, I believe, or, or part of it, some glimpse. Thank you, thank you for that, Naomi. And um, just appreciate you talking about sort of what are the conditions that has led us to this level, to this particular crisis. Um, and the impact that it's happening having on, on us around the world, but also what is it? What is so? What are we up against? So, so appreciate that. Now, I'd like to turn to you, um, Angela, and also to, to give you an opportunity to share sort of what is your assessment of the current moment. Um, you know what? You know what is your assessment of, of what's happening? Um, you know what? What is what's to come? Um, so, I'd like to turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon. First of all, let me say um, that um, I am really honored to be in dialogue with, um, with you, Naomi. Um, and thank you, Tenji Wei, and, you know, and, and Barbara Ransby, and Mo Mitchell, and all of the other organizers from the rising majority uh, who um, pull this um, amazing teaching together. Um, uh, I I guess the only thing I would add uh, would be that uh, for those of us who feel alone because we have been compelled to forego uh, the in-person social contacts that should sustain us, that always sustained us, I think we can feel strengthened and energized by, by the fact that we are connected to people all over the planet who at this moment are experiencing uh, similar conditions, and I'm thinking about, you know, what's happening in Palestine now. I'm thinking about uh, what's happening in Kurdistan, especially Syrian Kurdistan. I'm thinking about populations that are always, that are already subject to different modes of repression, who are much more likely to suffer during this period of, um, of, um, failed response to the coronavirus. Thank, thank you for that. And, and I have a, just a follow-up conversation for you, um, for you, Angela. You know, you've taught us so much over the years around the prison industrial complex um, and the carceral state. And so how do we understand this moment through an abolitionist lens? Uh, there's been call for release of folks who are locked up in jails and in prisons. Um, uh, and so what do you make of all of this and how, you know, what is this, what does it mean to, as a movement, be an abolitionist, um, you know, in this time? Well, first of all, Tinjui, thank you very much for this question that highlights the, the impact um, of the current conditions, the virus and the attempt to mitigate it on people who have already been forced to shelter in place. Uh, um, if there's been so much concern about people in situations such as uh, cruise, cruise ships where rapid transmission is inevitable, we should, of course, be even more concerned about people in jails and prisons and immigrant detention uh, facilities. First of all, people who are in jail are generally there for a short period of time, you know, maybe a month, six months. Uh, if they're doing time, it's, it's, it's always one year or less. Under the current conditions, however, a, say, three-month sentence can be tantamount to a death sentence. Uh, um, here in California, the governor has uh, ordered no new intakes into the state system, which is a good thing. Uh, uh, but it's possible that there will be such a backlog that the county jails will be severely overcrowded. And by the way, this would be a very appropriate time to shut down Rikers in, in New York. Uh, and I, I'm in Oakland, uh, California now, where, where, um, where I live. And uh, of course, many organizations uh, such as 
critical resistance, uh, no new jails, um, all of us are none, um, the transgender, gender variant, intersex justice project. Uh, these organizations have uh, demanded that, that many prisoners be released. Uh, and it's true that thousands of prisoners have already been released, but that is just a drop in the bus bucket, considering that 2.3 million people are behind bars in this country. Uh, um, we're especially demanding the immediate release of elders in prison. Uh, but of course, when we consider the fact that imprisonment always speeds, speeds up aging, when we speak of elders, we're talking about people over 50 years old. Uh, and I know most people who are 50 don't necessarily consider themselves old uh, in the so-called free world, but that is not the case behind bars. Uh, they're also calling for the release of all kids who are in juvenile facilities uh, and all people who are awaiting trial. They're also demanding an end to the so-called quality of life policing, uh, of which uh, creates the opportunity for the unnecessary arrest of so many people. Uh, and um, an extremely important and halt, a halt to all operations conducted by ICE. Uh, uh, because I think when we speak about the prison industrial complex, it's so important to recognize uh, that uh, immigrant detention is uh, uh, in many ways at the forefront uh, uh, of that process. What all this should teach us is that um, decarceration needs to happen, decarceration, which is an important abolitionist strategy. And it needs to happen not simply for the sake of those who are uh, behind bars, but for the sake of everyone's uh, health. You know, I was reading uh, Mike Davis's article in the Jacobin, uh, which he called the coronavirus, the corona crisis is a monster fueled by capitalism. Uh, and he made the point that the current pandemic expands the argument, uh, global, capitalism now appears biologically unsustainable in the absence of an international public health in infrastructure. But he says, such an infrastructure will never exist until people's movements break the power of big pharma and for-profit healthcare. And I know Na Naomi has uh, spoken about this and and, and, and um, she's the expert on disaster capitalism. We've been following your work, Naomi, for, for many years uh, uh, around uh, that issue. Um, um, so yeah, uh, abolition. Ab I think an abolitionist lens uh, requires us to um, think um, broadly and uh, and to remember, for example, that um, there are those who are unhoused. Uh, even if we do succeed in um, um, the effort to engage in decarceration of vast numbers of people who are behind bars, uh, many of those who leave jails or prisons will have only the street as a site to, sh so to shelter in place. Uh, and, and that shelter in place order incorporates a logic that assumes that people have houses and that people have money for food and also the means with which to stay in connection with others. Uh, um, Many, those in prison, those who've been released, don't have that luxury. So this leads us to talk about the need for accessible and free housing and food. Um, if Iran could release 70,000 prisoners out of 240,000, that's approximately one third of its prison population, the US should be able to follow suit which means authorities should release at least 765,000 people uh, 
from custody uh, at this moment. Thank, thank you for that, Angela. And you, you've sort of you've transitioned us really well um, as you sort of talk about what is the what is the most bold, uh, powerful demands that we need to be lifting up in this moment as it as it relates to all of our people um, in the U.S. and around the world. And, and this sort of um, transitions to the next question, which I, I'd love for you, Naomi, to start, which is how have we gotten a, a glimpse of what is possible through this crisis? Um, you know, we've just talked about our assessment and the context of the current conditions, but, you know, what is possible and also like what is required of us in this moment? Well, a, a great deal is required of us in this moment, uh, especially because we are in only in the early stages of this tremendous crisis. Um, you know, I think the lesson of the moment is that once you recognize that you are in an emergency, uh, a great deal is possible. And, and, and so many of us, you know, on, on this call, in this conversation and, 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 and listening in, have spent their lives trying to convince the rest of the world, powerful interests, that the status quo is an emergency. You know, whether it is mass incarceration, whether it is absolutely untenable levels of inequality and injustice, whether it is our war on nature. Um, uh, what gets declared an emergency is an expression of power. And, and in, in the United States, what we saw is actually a fair amount of pushback in the early days, and this is a big part of the reason why the U.S. is as unprepared as it, as it was, they didn't see it as a crisis. They didn't see it as an emergency. And a lot of people said out loud on Fox News uh, and, and outlets like it that they actually just thought old people and sick people should just quietly die in the name of the stock market. And I think the only reason why there has been an emergency mobilization, uh, even though it has been inadequate in the face of this crisis, I think honestly has a lot to do with the geographic uh, um, uh, uh, travels of this virus in the sense that it sort of hit parts of the world that frankly had a stronger social fabric before it hit the United States. And so we had precedents from China, from Southern Europe, where economies were shut down to save lives and that kind of forced the hand of the Trump administration. I, don't, I honestly don't know whether they ever would have done it if it hadn't hit Southern Europe first and they had been forced in this way. So crisis blows open the sense of what is possible, right? When I, when I wrote The Shock Doctrine and quoted Milton Friedman, and now he gets, this, he gets quoted a lot, you know, that only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change, um, you know, and when, when the crisis occurs, it depends on what ideas are lying around, right? That quote, and some of you may have heard me say that, um, the reason why Milton Friedman was as focused on having an intellectual infrastructure of disaster preparedness for the right, for the corporations, is because he understood that when capitalism produces its own crises and the, and the in injustices of the system are laid bare for all to see, as happened during the Great Depression, it is actually a huge opportunity for the left. And Milton Friedman wrote in a letter to Augusto Pinochet in the 70s that he said, I believe that everything went wrong in your country as well as mine in the 1930s when people got the idea that they could do good things with other people's money. So in other words, the whole strategy that they are deploying in order to move so quickly in the face of crisis to push forward their wish list is because they are afraid that we will push ours. Mm -hmm. They are afraid that we will demand precisely what Angela has been talking about, that we, that we empty the jails, that we demand homes for all, that we say, wait a minute, you had, you had a spare $6 trillion? We could, do a, we could do a damn good start of a Green New Deal with that, right? I mean, if you can pay people to stay home, you can pay people to retrain out of the fossil fuel sector, right? If corporations are on their knees asking for bailouts, the highest polluting sectors on the planet, uh, you know, oil companies, gas companies, airlines, car companies, cruise ship companies, with that means 
that we can take ownership over these sectors. We can wind them down if they are at war with life on earth. We can take care of their workers. So we need to, uh, to quote my colleagues at The Leap, which is you know, an organization that, that, that I co-founded, um, our job is to kick open the door of radical possibility as wide and as long as possible. And I think you know, the work that, that you have been doing, Tenjiwe, and, and the movement for Black Lives all of these years, we are in a better position in this crisis than we were what, the last time the global economy collapsed in 2008, when we were very clear that we were being forced to pay for the crisis of the bankers and we occupied squares and we said no. And I know there are people listening in from Southern Europe who were part of the movement of the squares and went on to form Podemos. But in that moment, we didn't put forward our radical alternatives with enough courage, with enough power. And that is what we need to do. And you know, it, I am so inspired by the workers at Amazon and Whole Foods and Instacart and GE and the nurses and you know, all the frontline workers who now realize how essential they are, despite having had their labor so denigrated that some of them are having to wear literally garbage bags to protect themselves from this virus. That is how capitalism sees them, literally as trash, are standing up and saying, no, 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 we, may, we hold the world up. And that's the energy that we need to be building on, that kind of worker power. And, and, and we are gonna have to be exercising our right to stop, to withhold that labor. And, to, and we, we need to be supporting those workers in every possible way that we can. So that's, sorry, I'm ranting, but like, <laughs> we need to kick the door open, keep it open. <laughs> One, it was in, it's inspiring. You know, I think, not I think, but I know this, this thing that you're saying to us is like, we need to be bold, we need to be confident to put forward the most transformative, bold demands, but also expand the realm of possibility in our imaginations because we're learning um, that what we thought perhaps was not possible before is clearly possible now. And so how are we putting forward the, lev the highest level of demands that really stretches sort of radical imagination, uh, you know, and it, it sort of real powerful, uh, 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 you know, perception of what's, what's possible in this and time. If I could just add one more thing, it's a race against time. It's a race against time because we haven't seen their worst ideas yet. You know, Angela mentioned Gaza. You know, folks in Gaza have been telling us for years that they're a laboratory for, for the rest of the world. Um, we, we, the, the, the first corona cases were, uh, were diagnosed in a, in a Mumbai slum today, okay? That's very worrying because what Angela is saying is true about people's inability to shelter, in, to shelter in place when you don't have a shelter. But what does a carceral state do in response to that? What does a Modi do? What does a Duterte do? What does a Bolsonaro do? It seals in the slum, right? It turns it into Gaza, okay? So unless we are out the, here saying, no, everybody has a right to a home, there's yep. a lot of empty hotels out there, yep. we will see a lot worse than we're seeing now. Yep. And, and I think that's why we have to frame this also as like, what is required of us in this moment? And um, I'd like to turn it over to you before we open it up to, to the other comrades on, on this um, teach, in, in this teaching is, is just as, Angela, if you could share, what do you believe is required of us in this moment and what has been made what is possible um what has been um what is clearly possible um for us to 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 understand um and uh inform the level of action and movement that we that we that we that we choose to do in in this moment so i'd like to invite you in to share just some of your thoughts well i absolutely agree uh, with uh, naomi that we should um um, think about the similarities uh, between the era of the 1930s and, and the present. Uh, and I think that um, um, many people are recognizing how unequipped capitalism is to truly serve the needs of, of, of people and other beings on, on the planet. Uh, um, uh, the, the reason uh, there's such a healthcare crisis uh, uh, is precisely because of the pr privatization uh, process that began in the 1980s, which is the same era that saw the rise of the prison industrial complex. 
hospitals now largely operate under the profit uh, mandates of capital and empty beds are not profitable. Stockpiles of equipment from ventilators to masks are not compatible with the, the um, just-in-time production. So global capitalism is really responsible for the inability to address this pandemic. Uh, it's also responsible for the vast numbers of people in prison and in detention facilities and for the high cost of health care and housing and, and education. And I think people have the capacity to realize that it did not have to happen this way. Uh, that healthcare does not have to be treated as a commodity to be bought and sold. That uh, people don't have to be in prison simply because there's no place for them in, in the current economy. But I also um, want to uh, point out that the crisis is revealing the nature of racial capitalism. Uh, you know, from the racism directed against Asian Americans of, you know, following the lead of, um, of um, what's his name, the current occupant of the White House, uh, to um, uh, the failure to provide testing kits to hospitals and clinics in Black neighborhoods. Uh, you know, Asian Americans have been spit, spit at and yelled at and physically attacked. And in places like um, uh, the Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, which it set up for testing, uh, there was a severe delay because they were not provided uh, with the test. You know, I think that we're, uh, we are recognizing and we have the capacity to um, organize uh, 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 against the structural racism uh, that drives our institutions, the everyday uh, uh, racism. Um, uh, and I think that um, we have the capacity to do feminist organizing, uh, uh, you know, what we might call abolition feminist organizing, uh, because um, um, all of these are feminist issues. Uh, uh, racism is a feminist issue. Homelessness is a feminist issue. Prison abolition is a feminist uh, issue. And, uh, but I think that, um, that we should take into consideration the fact that so many of the people who are um, at the center of this crisis on the front lines of this crisis are, 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 are women. Um, uh, women of all racial and ethnic backgrounds, poor women, trans women, uh, women especially in the countries of the global south. Um, and, and so um, I think that um, we should seize upon this as an, as an opportunity to do the kind of organizing that enhances uh, the the sense of a need for international solidarity. Uh, uh, this has the capacity to perhaps bring us out of our um, um, uh, US centric slumber and, 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 and to recognize that, that we can take leadership from people who are organizing in other parts of the world, Dom domestic workers all over the world who are now losing their job, of course, because of the stay at home orders. Uh, those who care for people uh, in the for-profit nursing industry, such the, the nursing home industry, such as uh, 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 the outbreak that happened in, um, in Washington. Uh, and, and I just wanna say one thing about um, um, gender violence and, 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 and child abuse uh, uh, because it, 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 seems, it seems that the whole notion of staying at home uh, is assumed to um, imply that, 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 that we can retreat to this kind of nurturing environment, uh, 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 this refuge. Uh, but for many, they're being forced to spend 24 hours a day with their abusers 
unable to connect with those who have been their lifelines and uh, children and, 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 and women who are abused. I think that this is, um, uh, this isn't, we should seize upon this as an opportunity to do the kind of organizing that is going to enhance our sense of belongingness to the world and um, enhance our sense of the possibility of moving beyond capitalism. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that, for that, Angela. And just, you know, we, it's so important that we don't disappear. Um, the most vulnerable of us, uh, particularly in this moment, whether it's frontline workers or children in homes and folks who are survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And that in this moment, what is required is that we see the full range of our people and how they're hurting in this moment and how are we centering them. And just wanna, as, as we sort of move to open up um, the, this panel to include some of the other comrades, just wanna thank the both of you for, for both naming sort of what is the, what is your assessment of the current condition of obviously coronavirus, but the product of racial capitalism and how it's led us here um, and also talking with us about what is what is the opportunities and the possibilities that our movement must seize in order to not just meet the demands of the current moment but also to be prepared and ready for what's to come and so just want to appreciate that and I really see this as a call to action to all of us on this call right now of what is required of us in this moment. So I'd like to invite in um, three other panelists and comrades uh, within the rising majority that are leaders within the rising majority. Cindy Wisner of, of Grassroots Global Justice, Maurice Mitchell of the Working Families Party, and and Lone Tran of Southern Vision Alliance. Um, and we, I just wanna say we know that people across the country and in the world are watching right now. To follow this conversation, please uh, use the hashtag online, the, ri the rising majority, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, rising, rising majority, um, the hashtag rising majority to follow discussion. And if you would like to sort of be connected to get updates, um, please text majority to 90975. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining. Thanks to the, to the additional three comrades and panelists for joining us. We just started to talk about um, this global perspective of how coronavirus um, is impacting the globe, how the response of coronavirus is impacting people internationally. And so Cindy, I'd like to um, pose this, this, this next question to you, um, which is um, what else do we need to be thinking about or paying attention to in this moment as we look, look to what's happening around the world? Uh, so, Cindy, I'll hand it off to you to, to, to share some of your thinking on this. All right. Saludos a todas y todas. Um, really honored to be um, in this dialogue and this conversation. I think to pick up on, on, on a couple of points that um, Angela and Naomi made, um, you know, uh, Antonio Gramsci, along with Friedman, writes a lot about uh, crisis. And the crisis, it either gives um, us an opportunity to do something or it gives the right wing an opportunity. And I feel that we have the opportunity to break the back of global neoliberalism. Um, or we look into a future of further authoritarianism or fascism. It's an opportunity for us to rethink the reorganization of society on a global level, from the very local, from neighborhood, um, all the way to um, our, our territories and to uh, across the world. And we have to be able to, at this moment, really reimagine and rethink and, and, and make sure that in this moment of so much deep trauma and hopelessness, that we don't lose that radical imagination. There are people living across the world and inside the United States in dire conditions with no access to water, no electricity, precarity. And part of what we're also seeing hand in hand, uh, we will see deep levels of repression and the curbing of democracy and democratic rights with the use of militarization. And I think this is one of those moments, not only are we making those immediate demands about masks and, and ventilators and funds to hospitals and to grocery workers, we have to also take a stand against no war, no militarization and stopping the occupation. We need to end the sanctions. Sanctions already or slow deaths. People are gonna die not only of coronavirus, but they're gonna die of hunger. And we need to be in solidarity now more than ever with people from Iran, from Venezuela, from North Korea, from Cuba, 
Palestine, Zimbabwe, and the 30 other countries that have sanctions against them. Number two, I think it's an opportunity for us to really think about how many movements around the world have been experimenting with alternatives to capitalism that have really thought about the needs that social movements have been putting out food sovereignty as an alternative, uh, food production, right? Small farmers cool the planet is what La Via Campesina says. Um, feminist economy, the vibrant feminist movement around the world that has been in motion, that has been at the forefront of authoritarianism, has been talking about a feminist, the need for a feminist economy. Um, environmentalist, indigenous peoples have been talking about, uh, EJ communities have been talking about a regenerative economy. Um, indigenous peoples in the Andes talking about Buen Vivir and different experiments around socialism of the 21st century. And I think it's a moment for us to be able to say, we need desperately an alternative to this capitalist, colonialist, patriarchal, racist, ableist system. And we've been working and all of our movements across the world have been working on those alternatives. We know how to be able to serve the needs of people and center life in a very different way. And I think that's one of the things that movements around the world are talking about. How do we center, now that home has become the site of struggle, as Angela said, it's also the site of hope, but it's also a moment where reproductive labor has automatically become so visible, right? From our homes, to our communities, to our workplaces. Reproductive labor of folks that do service are now at the forefront of, of saving the planet. And I think that one of the things that I think we need to really think about is this moment to, de, uh, to dismantle the neoliberal patriarchal system that we live in, because the responses of Trump and Bolsonaro and Duterte have all been patriarchal approaches to the crisis. And I think that we need to be able to understand that, that, that ultimately we have the solutions. The people who got us into this mess are not going to take us out of it. And we have the opportunity to be those defenders of life and territories and knowledge and know that we have an alternative. So there's a couple of places that I think around the world that there's been very clear demands starting to be articulated to end the sanctions now. The second one is to cut military budgets from the local on up, all the way to the national, to the, to, the, to the local, to the statewide. And then three, there's been this bailout, being able to not bail out corporations and CEOs and transnational corporations, but to actually bail out the people. Because there, we're in a moment where that is what is intention. And I think that we need to be able to do that. We need to support homes for all. We need to support services and relief effort for undocumented people, for all people. We need to be able to repe repeal the authorization, a use of military force. And we need to be able to talk about what is it that we want, not just what we're against, but this is the moment more than ever to talk about what we want. Thank you so much, Cindy. And, and thanks for just like censoring it, how, how critical international solidarity is, but really like that victory only happens at the product of, build, of global movement building in this moment, that we only achieve a radical realignment of power, we only achieve an interracial capitalism if we build the, love, the, 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 the type of global movement um, uh, a, around the world um, that is able and ready um, to, to, to re, you know, drastically realign the power as it is. So you, you brought up a number of different things from um, the need to center the people and not corporate executives, not the corporations, not financial institutions. So I wanna bring in Maurice Mitchell um, with the Working Families Party into this, into this conversation. You know, many people have talked about um, the stimulus bill and how it, you know, it centered the needs of financial institutions and corporations and not necessarily the, the needs of the people. Um, and so we need to talk about sort of um, who's in office. Um, and this is an election year. And so can you share a little bit about sort of what are the implications of this pandemic for this, for this election? Um, and can you speak about any other sort of thinking that you have around what do we need to consider as it relates to who's in office, um, elections, um, and the current moment that we're in? Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, Ken Huey. And it's an honor to be um, in conversation with Cindy Weissner, Lone Tran, Naomi Klein, and Angela Davis. So I just really appreciate um, uh, being in conversation at this time of crisis. Um, so 
uh, to answer your question, the implications are, are profound. Now, traditionally, movement organizers have built power, electoral power or otherwise, through face-to-face -face conversations, you know, at the doors, through, um, uh, you know, canvassing at the doors or in our communities, either small groups of people coming together or mass rallies, right? We have conversations, we build connections, we build relationships. Relationships are the, the uh, most basic building block of our movements. And now we can't build relationships in the same way because we have to shelter in place and we have to uh, observe social distancing in order to save our lives and save the lives of people in our community. So we must adapt. And we are adapting by engaging in all means of communication in order to talk to our folks using texting and calling folks and digital organizing like we're doing right now. Um, we're using color codes on our doors or on our windows to communicate our needs and whether or not we're safe. Um, you know, can't hold a traditional rally? Well, we could hold a Zoom call, call with tens of thousands of people like we're doing right now. Or we could raise our voices out our windows like many people are doing around the world. Uh, this is the moment when we're going to have to adapt and we're gonna have to innovate in order to continue to build the bonds of our relationships, even as we're isolated. We're isolated, but we're certainly not alone. Um, and this is a moment when people on the far right and Republicans are calling for universal basic income. And at the same time, they're, they're calling for um, having uh, grandparents uh, essentially uh, sacrifice themselves for the market. And so what that demonstrates to me is that the logic of neoliberal capitalism is no longer making sense at this moment. And that organized capital and the folks uh, in Washington that prop them up are in disarray. And they'll do what's necessary in order to prop up the system. Um, and if that incidentally means providing some people relief, so be it. So this is a moment when our political leadership and our clarity is so critical. Now, the Working Families Party and many of our allies are developing these new tactics for the moment because we cannot retreat in this moment. Now more than ever, and you know, we, we've already heard from uh, the previous speakers, we need leaders that are accountable to working people and not just in the United States, but globally, right? And there's gonna be a tug of war between the interests of, of corporations and the interests of working people. And so social movements, and people coming from social movements could play a critical role in filling that gap, um, which is why we need more and more people on the local and statewide level uh, who are coming from social movements and accountable to social movements running for office. So some folks might question whether or not that's true, that whether or not the energy of the left is better spent in doing direct action or building mass movements, and we shouldn't race our time with elections in this moment. But what we're seeing play out, I think underscores why building electoral power is crucial in this moment. Um, imagine, if you will, if Donald Trump were not president, the federal response would look very different. We could measure that in hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, to, to use a more local example, uh, uh, Governor Kemp in Georgia has utterly failed to grapple with this pandemic and people are going to die because of his response. Now, just let that sink in for a moment. People are going to die because an election was stolen from Stacey Abrams in 2018. So given that, we understand that elections aren't our only strategy in this moment. We need strikes, rent strikes, mortgage strikes, strikes of essential workers, um, like, like Nomi talked about, like the, the workers who are gallantly striking Amazon and Instacart, work, uh, Instacart workers and others. We need mutual aid on the ground, and we're seeing a lot of that. We need protest movements making bold demands and offering inspiring, soul-affirming solutions to people who desperately need them. Uh, but we also need to translate all of that into electoral consequences. Working people must seize all levels of power and working people, we simply don't have the luxury to leave any tool on, on the table, including electoral tools. And that's why we have to make sure that democracy actually continues. And when I say democracy, I mean, we need to ensure that true democracy, radical democracy, blooms in this moment, right? So not just election day, but 365 days of the week, civil society fully blooming in this moment. Um, and this is a very fragile and uncertain moment and nothing is given. Authoritarians around the world will mimic each other. And we need to ensure that the right wing in our country does not use this moment as an opportunity in order to snuff the, the little semblance of democracy we have left. And so, 
you know, we, we could look at what's already taking place in Hungary, and I guarantee you, Donald Trump is paying attention. And so we have to be vigilant. We have to uh, wake ourselves up from the dream of American exceptionalism. This is truly a global movement. Um, I'll just end by saying that, you know, the, the current coronavirus outbreak and the shelter in place efforts, I think what they've really exposed is a need for a massive expansion of our democracy and the voter infrastructure. So specifically, um, we're engaging in campaigns around a concept where all Americans should be able to vote from home. Uh, we think that that is just common sense in a moment where we might not be able to physically leave our homes. And we need to ensure that all Americans have their ballots mailed to them in enough time where they could return those ballots in a number of ways. So that's just one concrete solution that could ensure that people are able to be heard in November. So big moments like this are exactly what needs to happen during great political realignments. But, and, and it's, always, it's already been spoken how they could swing either way. I think Rising Majority, uh, Working Families Party and our allies in the movement, you know, we need to build a multiracial coalition in this country that we've never seen before. Or the corporate white right wing white supremacist alliance will use this crisis to further entrench their power. Uh, every year we reach out to millions of, of Americans around voting for progressives. And that's on the hyper local level all the way up because we understand that these reins of power actually really matter for our folks. Um, and we're gonna continue to do that. And we need to figure out new ways of doing it and broadening um, that appeal to the millions and millions and millions of people um, who are uh, trying to make sense of this moment. This is not simply a mo moment for folks on the left to talk to other people who are self-identified leftists. This is opportunity for left solutions to inspire the entire country. And so I just, I just want to close uh, really quickly um, just to uh, encourage everybody to go to the Rising Majority website where there's, there's actual solutions and steps that people could take uh, from the Working Families Party and other folks to get involved. For example, we're building an army of, of volunteer texters who could text from home in order to engage people all around the country. And I invite folks to, to join the movement and join the other organizations at, uh, at the Rising Majority that are doing the work that, that we will need in order to weave together um, that coalition. Uh, thank you so much for, for, that, for that, Mo. And now I'd like to bring in um, you, Lone, into the conversation. And, and then we'll, 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 we'll end this with, with one, uh, one last question to, to all the panelists. But you know, we, we were committed to building the rising majority um, and build, because we believe we need to build an anti-racist left committed to radical democracy. And so you know, I know, Lone, that your work is broader than this. But, but can you say a few words about the ways in which xenophobia and anti-Asian racism is playing out during this crisis? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chinji Wei, and thanks to the other. Um, panelists who are part of this teaching, uh, really appreciating this dialogue. Um, you know, Trump's anti-Asian and specifically anti-Chinese rhetoric in this moment, calling COVID-19 a foreign virus or a Chinese virus, um, has been obviously very unapologetic and uncensored. And on a basic level, we know that this kind of rhetoric says it doesn't matter if Asian people die from this pandemic. Um, but what this kind of rhetoric also says about Asian people is that it's okay if our people are the casualties of imperialist wars, uh, the casualties of climate disasters and environmental extraction, the casualties of occupation and neocolonialism, both within the U.S. borders and those asserted by the U.S. empire all around the world, it's okay if Asian people um, are the casualties of unpaid work, of exploitation, uh, of hunger, of solitary confinement, of housing insecurity. Um, and so I, I hope now that it's really clear for all of those of us who are in who are coming into movement, that this kind of anti-Asian rhetoric also lays the basis and justification for social and economic policy, which doesn't only kill Asian people, it kills all of us. Um, and, and as others have already spoken to this, especially those of us who were already vulnerable before this crisis, um, who are living in occupied communities, who are living inside of prisons and detention centers, um, who are living you know, with the reality of unlivable wages um, and, and uh, dilapidated dilapid updated schools and facing police sirens and ICE agents. Um, and so what, what I'm trying to say here is that Trump's anti-Asian racism is 
quite insidious. And unfortunately, it's hardly a new move from the playbook, right? Uh, we know that these social and economic policies um, that will emerge from this crisis, unless we organize and organize like hell, will only continue to exacerbate the realities um, of a totally gutted infrastructure of a democracy which currently only works for the rich, um, and that is anchored by an increasingly fascistic government. Uh, we know that the anti-Asian racism and xenophobia being championed by Trump and his administration reveals what the real crisis is. It's capitalism, it's racial capitalism, where white supremacy and anti-blackness and racism are the bedrock. And the othering and demonizing of Asian people in this particular moment, it's a maneuver by the elite that we've seen before to hide what is actually truly unacceptable, that right now multinational corporations like Amazon can use racism to protect themselves and receive the massive bailouts from the so-called free market, continue to profit while our people are forced to simply wait and die. And so we've seen this kind of othering and xenophobia for, before. It faces our Muslim sisters and brothers. It faces our undocumented loved ones. It faces black, brown, and indigenous kin all across the country, which was built upon you know, some really murderous interpretations of, of who belongs where and who belongs to whom. And so whatever we do, we really have to remember that it's not the fault of Asian people, it's not the fault of black people and people of color, of migrants, of women, of workers that we're facing a global pandemic. We have to point our fingers at the right targets. We have to hold these institutions accountable and we have to really build power to unseat the institutions which unreasonably get to determine whether our people get to live or die. And so I think it's fairly simple at the end of the day that COVID-19 is a virus, capitalism is the crisis, this and our organizing and our solidarity is the answer. Um, and so I just want to punctuate again um, that, you know, for anyone who really wants to throw down, who wants to deepen the struggle in this moment and beyond, um, to check out The Rising Majority, um, you can go to www.therisingmajority.org to sign up for updates and actions. Um, you can also text squad up to 90975. And for those who are connected to organizations, we'll be hosting some information soon, soon in the future. I think everything that folks have named, releasing prisoners, livable wages, housing for all, that is now the floor. It is not the ceiling. So what's the new ceiling going to be? Um, and, and we're really hoping to fight for that um, with the rising majority. So we'll hope that folks will join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Loan. Uh, so this, this brings us towards sort of the close of this teaching. And I, I want to invite in um, Angela Davis and Naomi Klein back into the conversation. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot, again, in terms of what is happening, what are we up against, but also what is required um, of us in this moment? Um, what is the type of power we need to build? So just want to uh, turn it over to you for, for, for any sort of final words um, and message to the activists, um, the thousands of activists that are tuned in right now, the rising majority leaders, the organizers, folks on the front lines. Um, if you can, share any sort of final words that you have for all of us that are looking for um, what is required of us in this moment? What is leadership? What does power look like? So, um, Naomi, perhaps I'll start with you and then we'll, we'll go to Angela, Angela Davis. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, well, first of all, just thank you for, for to, to Bo and Lone and Cindy for, for those fantastic um, uh, uh, ideas and, 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 and display of real leadership for this moment. Um, a couple thoughts. I, a lot of what I have know about, about the transformative power of crisis I learned from living in Argentina. Um, after Argentina's economy collapsed in 2001 and they went through five presidents in three weeks and um, everything collapsed and people started building something new in the rubble. And one of the things that, that, that I, I witnessed and, and really changed me um, was a movement of uh, factories that were being abandoned by their owners being turned into workers' cooperatives. And I, I raise that because when we talk about international solidarity and I really appreciate Cindy talking about how we need to learn um, from the leadership in the global south and from indigenous communities in the global north, um, from the food sovereignty movement. We also need to learn from the factory occupation movement because there is going to be a collapse of small businesses. And if we don't want to end up in a world where Jeff Bezos is the last man standing, um, then what needs to happen is that workers 
who are working at, at restaurants that are closing and nail salons that are closing and all kinds of businesses that are closing have the right to take over those workplaces and turn them into cooperatives. I think that's part of what we need to be fighting for. There's legislation that this is part of what a people's bailout means. Um, so I, I just want to throw that out there. Um, I, one other idea that, that, that I think is important is um, I'm, I think there's incredible digital organizing going on right now. Um, one of the things we're seeing is that um, we have a right to the internet. It is a public utility, but right now it is in the hands of a few very large corporations. And when we talk about repression and we talk about authoritarian responses to this crisis, that includes the ability, unfortunately, to unilaterally shut down our organizing when we're organizing on corporate platforms. So we need to be aware of that and we need to be ready for it. Um, you know, if we look at what has happened in India under Modi and just locking down Kashmir's um, you know, access to the internet, we need to be able to find each other without Mark Zuckerberg's permission. Um, and there's lots of different ways that that needs to manifest, but I think it needs to be front of mind. Um, at the same time as we fight for a true digital commons as part of, of the transformation we need. I want to shout out the People's Bailout. Um, people can go to that, that website. The Green Stimulus, people can check that out. I mentioned uh, the leap.org. These, you know, these, the, these are our organizations that are putting forward some really key frameworks and other people have mentioned other ones. Um, let's Let's remember a couple of things that a lot of us are realizing. One, we miss each other. <laughs> um, so even as we spend a lot of time on screens, I think at the other end of this, I, I, you know, personally, I'd like to spend less time on screens and, and, and more time in community and in face to face. And I want to live in a world that makes that easier and more possible. Um, let's remember the love that we feel for caregivers. Um, and let's build an economy that values and lifts up and is rooted in, in the need for us to care for one another. Let's remember the solace that we've taken in nature in the midst of all of this in the spring. And let's build an economy that is about taking care of each other and taking care of the planet. It is possible to do. Um, it will take all the tools that, that, that Mo mentioned, the rent strikes, the debt strikes, maybe even a general strike. Um, I don't think it will have a hashtag, so we're gonna have to figure out um, ways of organizing that are not uh, brought to us by Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, yeah, um, one of the things that I, 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 that is hardest about this crisis is having a seven-year-old and, and teaching him to be afraid of people mm -hmm. um, because everybody's got germs. Um, and that is the exact opposite of the lesson that I try to teach him uh, and that I think that we all know and that what this has all been about, which is that we, we are all we have. We, 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 and, and, and as people try to turn us against each other, we have to remember that. And even as we isolate, we must reach towards each other and build maximum power because everything's on the line. Mm. Thank you, Naomi. We must reach for each other. Um, uh, Angela, I'd love for you to, to share some words um, to all those that are listening and with us right now um, as we close, close this program. Well, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to have this exchange. Um, I have um, learned a great deal in this last hour, and I'm aware of the fact that, um, that people are watching from other parts of the world. And I'm asking myself um, uh, whether we can create similar conversations involving people uh, from Africa, uh, from um, South America, uh, from India, of course. I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that um, in, in, in Brazil, um, uh, the situation is far worse than it is here. Uh, and I, I'm not going to talk about the similarities between the, 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 the two leaders. Um, but, but I do think that we in the United States uh, can uh, find leadership from uh, people in places like Brazil and South Africa who are searching to creatively address 
this crisis. Uh, um, what I keep coming back to is the fact that um, the, we're, we are at this moment compelled to live within the boundaries of nation states. But um, nation states no longer um, function in a way uh, that um, helps enhance our lives. Uh, as a matter of fact, the nation state is becoming increasingly obsolete. Uh, and this is what we're seeing during this crisis. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to um, international, global conversations and, 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 and organizing. And I think that um, um, these kinds of conversations should happen over and over. Digital organizing, yes. Uh, um, and we need to be prepared to um, hit the ground running uh, when we're finally able to be in contact with each other in person. Uh, we're going to need to organize massive uh, 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 demonstrations and, and movements and supporting. We're going to have to support all of the, the strikes uh, and we're going to have to try to create lasting formations that will assist us in, in moving um, away from uh, this um, capitalist monster and toward a better future. So thank you very much, uh, Naomi. Thank you, Tanjiwe. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Cindy and Mo and Loan and all of the others uh, who are behind uh, this event in Rising Majority. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. And thank you for always uh, reminding us that we need to be both uh, have a global analysis, um, but also be global, global thinking in our organizing. Uh, and that we need to continue to have these discussions, that we need to expand it so that we're engaging with movement leaders from Brazil um, to, to South Africa. And so um, thank you for that. And also, clearly, for everyone watching, this is a moment of learning. This is a moment of growing. But this is also a call to action. We are in a moment of crisis, but we are also in a moment that is requiring us to be our boldest, most powerful selves. And at our, at our um, footsteps in this moment, we have the opportunity, but also we have the requirement and the demand to be more unified, to be more aligned, and to work in such deep, powerful strategy together to build the movement not only our children and our planet deserve, but our children yet to be born. So thank you everyone for, for being here with us from all around the world. Thank you to the very brilliant, the very extraordinary Naomi Klein and Angela Davis for sharing your brilliance. Thank you to the comrades Maurice Mitchell, Cindy Wisner, Lone Tran for bringing forth just the analysis and the perspective, but again, the call to action. Want to um, ask everybody who's joining with us to continue to follow this conversation online. We need to be in community. We need to practice love, but we also need to find each other. So use the, the hashtag rising majority to follow more conversations and more teachings. Um, if you want to be connected, if you want to get um, digital updates, text majority to 90975. Again, majority to 90975. And also go to the, to the com um, to just stay up to date with, with what's happening. I just want to say, we know that people are scared. We know that people are dealing with just the challenge of this moment. And that we know that what will, um, what will aid us is each other, is to reach for each other. What will aid us is community. What will aid us is the love that we have for each other. And what will aid us in this time is knowing just how powerful we are. And so thank you for joining. Um, we will see you out um, soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.